speaking of self-care, that's going to be our next point. Point number four is invest time in self-care. So, um, some good ways to do that would be become mindful, identify when you are flaring up or having a flashback or a trigger, and ask yourself what could be causing it and act like a detective. So this was, um, I don't remember who said this when I originally read about it, but it's a great idea to try to look at it like you're a detective. Um, and that can help because you're separating yourself from the situation and you always want to be a little bit detached from these things that you feel maybe shameful about that are related to your mental uh, health because we, we can get to, we, we are not helpful towards ourselves if we take our own stuff personally, which is funny, right? But the cool thing is, is if you learn how to not take your own stuff personally and act like a detective, that means you can do it for everyone else too. So you won't take other things personally either. So <laughs> it gives you a healthy amount of like space to be able to look at it objectively. Think of it this way. This is something Terry Cole says. She says, you can only keep your side of the street clean. This is very helpful for people who have CPTSD who also struggle with codependency issues or if you're an empath or highly sensitive person. So what I mean by this is you can only be responsible for your 50% and that sucks, but it's also extremely relieving at the same time to hear. I know the first time I heard this, I didn't like it. Um, my CBT therapist called it not my circus, not my monkeys. And she would do this whenever I would decide to spend my entire therapy session talking about my boyfriend, like, and his problems, or I guess my ex-boyfriend at this point, but like when I, the person I was dating at the time. So yeah, look at it as keeping your side of the street clean. So what that means is that you are 50% of any relationship, that, that's the good and the bad. Um, if something goes wrong, you know, you can feel a little bit better knowing that you were only 50% of that. You, it's never going to be, it's never going to be that, that, uh, the problem happens and they, and it's going to be 100% you. And when something good happens, it's 100% because of them. Uh, it's always going to be 50%. And it, sometimes it's not even easy to identify. Sometimes you'll have things happen in people's life, like in your life where someone will be like, it's not you, it's me. And when they say that, they, they're, I get they're trying to take accountability and responsibility, and that's fine. And you might feel like, okay, they're, they're taking 100% of the responsibility for this issue. But in reality, even if they tell you that, and, and maybe it's because they don't feel it's their place to tell you what your problems are, or maybe it's because they are not actively thinking of your problems, they're only thinking about their own. Regardless of the reason, it's still your job to walk away from that situation where they're saying it's 100% their deal and ask yourself what is your 50% and I say that because like I said it's it's always going to be that way um, it can help take the pressure off if the other person isn't sitting there telling you all of your faults <laughs> they're only taking responsibility for their half it can actually be very relieving if that's what they do because then it you know, if you if you know this fact that um, it's 50-50, then it kind of leaves that space for you to take the time to reflect and say, okay, they figured out theirs, now I'm going to sit and my mind is free and clear to be able to say, well, what was my part? What can I do better? Give yourself that freedom to remember that it's only going to be half. Uh, another good one is turn inward for coping, uh, not outward. Now, this one is tricky. I think you should actually do both. Originally, I'd said turn inward and not outward, but I think you should do both. I think you should, but gauge how much you do it. So I would say turn inward for a lot of the coping. So ask yourself what you need, do a lot of inner reflection, do that meditation, do the different techniques for yourself that work, go for a nature walk, make yourself food you like, la la la, list out those things that, that make you feel good. But then also sometimes if you need to turn outward, like especially for breaking yourself out of a depression loop, you might need to gain some objectivity. So it means you need to reach out. So you need to turn outward and ask people. And so that might be like something like just going on a forum and just saying how you feel going on one of these support groups and just venting how you feel or turning to a close friend and telling them how you feel and making sure you clarify with these people that you are not seeking advice, you are just needing to cope and so therefore part of your coping involves outwardly expressing yourself or extroverting your feeling as it's also um, called. I have actually, when I have done a lot of inward coping and I was very depressed one of the last times I was, this was like a few months ago. I did everything I could and I couldn't break out of a depression loop and I was watching a Frank James video and he had suggested how to break out of one and he talked about gaining objectivity through other people and it involved speaking up and telling and talking to people and reaching out and 
it actually worked. I reached out to a friend and I didn't, I felt so guilty about it. I didn't like it. I, when you're depressed, like you don't want to do that. You feel like you're burdening people, right? And it made like my skin crawl to do it. And I just felt sick, but like I was laying in bed all day. I wasn't, I wasn't even getting up and eating. And I just, you know what? That's exactly what I told her when she, when she messaged me. I just said, I'm struggling to get up and even make myself food. And her hearing that was enough for her to be like, to offer, um, you know, something to, to do. And for me, when I get like that, I like to have distractions. So, um, I like to be able to go out and get out of my head. So she offered if I wanted to go out, if I felt up to it, um, I didn't have to make food. We could go out to eat. This was before COVID. So I was like, sure. And that really helped me. Um, but for some people, they might just want to have someone who will listen. Uh, and maybe distractions don't always work for people who are depressed, um, or getting out in front of people might be really hard when they're depressed. Um, but sometimes when you, you know, if you have a friend who knows that you need that little kick in the butt so you can get up, then it can help. So the next one would be identify your personal healthy and unhealthy coping mechanisms without judgment. So yeah, so when you have like a time where you can be compassionate with yourself, take the time to list out the things that you know you normally do as for coping and then the things that are healthier that maybe don't feel as fun to do or like they don't strike you right away because you don't do them as often. So like a good example would be like unhealthy coping mechanisms are like shopping addiction, alcohol or drug reliance, Drama seeking, that's a big one. People don't think of it, but sometimes drama seeking is a good coping mechanism. Heavy validation seeking, that's a really bad uh, unhealthy coping mechanism. Things like that. I can't think of any more right now. Those are just the ones off the top of my head. And then like you got your list of your healthy coping mechanisms, which most of the time you'll be able to come up with these when you're in a more clear, happy mindset. So when you're like in more of like a mindset where you've already t taken care of your basic needs, like you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, once you've done all those, just sit down and like think of the things you like. Go back to like, Elizabeth Gilbert says, puts it this way, she's like, go back to the things that you enjoyed doing when you were a kid and don't feel shameful for indulging in these childlike, the childlike wonder that comes with these things that you enjoyed. And I've definitely noticed that yes, if I revert back to a lot of the things I enjoyed when I was a kid, um, those are my healthy coping mechanisms. I love... Um, skating, I love swimming, I love nature, and um, I love music and art. So um, when I indulge in those things, those are my healthy coping mechanisms. Sometimes you can't just replace the coping mechanism, the unhealthy coping mechanism. You might have to sit there and ask yourself why, like why you're still doing it, um, or why you want it. Or maybe telling yourself you can do it, but maybe wait on it and give it 24 hours and then ask yourself if you still want to do it. Because that's, that's a good one. Most of these things are anxiety related. If you feel the pressure to do it right away, so you can usually appease your anxiety by saying, I'll do it, but like, I'll do it later. And then, you know, but like with the intention of like really holding true to saying you will do it later. So your anxiety, you know, trusts you. That you'll do it and then then you can reevaluate once you've given it time and see if you still want to do it and if you slip on these things and you do some of these unhealthy coping mechanisms really just this is where compassion is really important and don't beat yourself up if you do that just understand that you did that you know one step forward two steps back or the you know two steps forward one step back thing like understand that's what happened uh, and understand like start making a game plan going forward and always just kind of learn as you go like understand it's like a learning experience yeah definitely reconnect with nature and go for walks um even if this wasn't one that you particularly had as a like a coping mechanism that you know you like from like childhood or anything like that there is scientific evidence uh that shows that nature walks are really good for your health because the trees let off these things called terpenes that when you breathe them in, they, it's usually around the three to four foot height mark. And when you, uh, usually it happens in like dense canopy forests. So a lot of eucalyptus or pine trees have the highest amount of terpenes, but the trees actually put off these things that are help with de-stressing. Um, and also something about looking at nature, trees and things like that. We see like fractals and patterns and things like that in them. They're supposed to be relaxing for the mind. So nature really is built for us to help us um, cope and with stress and things like that. So this, you know, understanding the science behind it helps you to get into it and get in touch with it. 
that's that's the reason why I recommend nature walks even if it wasn't on your list originally for coping mechanisms give it a shot I recommend also using Epsom salts when taking a bath or try sensory deprivation if you have an area that's got a float tank uh, I highly recommend it it can be very very good a lot of people don't realize they're magnesium deficient magnesium is extremely good for helping the body relax and if you have trouble with being anx anxious or antsy and or you've got like joint pain or like IBS that's a big one um, all of these things that are interrelated with having um, autoimmune issues or um, mental health issues floating can really be beneficial it also is great if you cannot normally get your mind in a place to meditate you're gonna be able to classically train your brain to know that the float tank is your quiet time and it is your place for meditating even if you can't clear your mind I also tell people that even if you can't clear your mind uh, just use the tank to let yourself process through thoughts and let them run through your head it's very very healthy Create a ritual as you practice self-hypnosis or meditation. This is very good too, yeah. Uh, kind of give yourself a ritual so your brain knows that this is what's coming. So like, you know, light some incense, take a bath, and then transition into your meditation. Another one that I heard that was really good is give yourself a dedicated space for it. So I know I like to meditate, but that's because I didn't have a space for it before. Now that I'm living with my roommate, her and I both are big advocates of um, meditation. So we actually got a house that has a, we, a room that was separate that we call a Zen Den. And our Zen Den is our meditation space. It is dedicated for that. So I know if I need to go to my self-care space and get a book or some wisdom or some me time in or I need something where my brain will click and know that I'm here to meditate then that's you know that's my I'm creating that ritual so that's what that room is for so give yourself a space use a guest bedroom um, just carve out a little zone for yourself that you know that when you look at it that's gonna be your um, spot for you to be able to get into that mindset to meditate because it can be really tough once you get into the habit of it meditating you'll start seeing the benefits but it can take a while it uh, it can take months before it really be feels habitual and like you get really deep into it another good one is try yoga before you meditate to mentally prepare the other reason why yoga is really good and i recommend it for people with cptsd and anxiety and depression is because if you got depression first of all yoga can get your body moving and we might not want to move particularly but if you just even start with like the yoga breathing, I mean, <laughs> then you can might be able to work your way up to stretching and moving and things like that. Another benefit of yoga for um, anxiety and CPTSD, as Pete Walker talks about it, it's good for the somatic body responses. So your stretching is somatic in a way where it gets you, it connects your mind with your body and you can, when you're doing movements that are in flow with like if they're in sync uh, breathing and moving at the same time those things will help calm you down and uh, help re-regulate you so they're really really good dancing is another good one for that too another one is take a nap or relax if your body gets locked in high anxiety or depression always listen to the body I definitely agree with this one if you are depressed and you're getting in that state and you feel like you can't move and you just want to nap like when it first hits Maybe just do it. Maybe just take a nap. Um, and then maybe if, you, if you're if really concerned that you'll just do this all the time, that first nap, put on like, uh, like just do, like reach over and just put on a meditation video on YouTube of something that you want, like letting go of overthinking or, or clearing negative energy or whatever, and just let it play in the background and then just take your nap. Because if you, if you give your body what it's asking for early on, you give yourself just enough energy to possibly problem solve and figure out why you're depressed later. But if you try to fight it, I don't think that that particularly works. I do think there has to be active amounts of asking yourself where the depression is coming from. And the thing I've always noticed is that depression comes, I read this in the self-hate versus compassion book. Depression hits us uh, and it's there to tell us that we have hit a wall in understanding of how to move forward so therefore that's why we get depressed we basically don't see a way to move forward towards the thing we want or or the thing we desire and we feel bad about it we usually feel shameful or guilty or something that there's that, that's where the beating up comes into play right and so what well, yeah depression's there to tell us hey you've hit this wall of understanding and what it's really trying to do is challenge our ability to maybe ask ourselves curiously how we can get over that 
So if you need to do the hungry, angry, lonely, tired thing while you're depressed, so taking care of those needs first, do it. And definitely, this is another great place to give, just congratulate yourself every little small step that you take. So you got a depressed day and you took a nap and then you brush your teeth and that's all you could do, good job. And then also make sure you're keeping people around you that will congratulate you and support you when you do these small things too, when you tell them you're depressed and they see that you got up and ate. This is what my roommate did for me. She would hug, come over and hug me and tell me good job. Um, and it's really, really important to have people who will do that, who understand it's a small victory to get over these things. But yeah, just listen to the body. Listen to what it's trying to say to you because um, your depression is trying to tell you something. Every single state, uh, emotional state you hold comes from a legitimate source within you that's trying to tell you something. So listen to it. And then another one would be invest in a hobby. So some people don't really know what to do with their time. Uh, and when they're trying to come up with self-care activities, they, they, they don't really know where to even start. So trying out a hobby, investing in something that you've never done before might be fun. Um, and it can be also a great self-care um, practice. So number five is know and uphold your boundaries. Boundaries are how you show love and respect to yourself and others, and boundaries are a kind way to teach people how to not step on your toes and vice versa. It is an act of self-love and essential to uphold this even when it triggers you. I know often it can feel like setting boundaries is like you're punishing yourself or other people, and perhaps the thing I've noticed is if you're setting a boundary and it feels like that, there's only one of two things going on. Either your boundary's too rigid, or the person that you're setting the boundary with is somehow shaming or guilting you for it and that person needs to go. So um, so figure out which one it is first though. <laughs> um, it can be kind of hard to discern that. Uh, but a, a great way to discern it is um, do some reading about rigid versus uh, porous and then firm boundaries. And if you know for a fact that you're actively trying a firm boundary as opposed to a rigid or a porous one, and that person's still telling you that they feel like you're punishing them or they don't like what you're doing, then you know that they gotta go. But if you know your boundaries have been a bit rigid and they could be better, try to tell them first of all that you need some compassion and understanding at the, during this time while you're trying to learn how to soften your boundaries up a bit and always explain that things are compromisable if they wanna talk to you about it. Um, that way, um, and then also if you trust them, ask them to call you out if you feel your boundaries too rigid and um, ask them for suggestions on how to do better if you trust this person to be good at setting boundaries themselves. Understand that it will get easier with time. It's not easy at first. Don't be afraid to change your lifestyle or environment if it doesn't help you grow. This one actually is great um, for depression. I, I, it's how I kick depression. Um, I was told to take pills for it and I tried and it didn't work for me. Uh, and then I decided to just change my environment instead and it worked wonders. So remember that boundaries go both ways. Uh, don't use mental health as a crutch for your behavior and take responsibility for your mental health. And if you do something during a flashback that's out of character or if you do something during anxiety that's out of character or depression, understand that it was part of your mental health issue and apologize for it and own it. So yeah, so this goes for you and for anyone that you're with. It's very important that if you hold yourself to a certain standard of, of um, taking accountability for your mental health that the other person does too. And also it's very important you both acknowledge and um, cheer each other on sort of for doing it. You want there to be that acknowledgement that you guys are both doing this, that you're in it together, that it's you, the other person, and then the mental health issue that you both, you know, you, the mental health thing is like a separate entity, so it's like a triangle, you know? Think of it that way. Uh, and then that way you both can feel like a team when handling these things, because everything in life is going to be like, that's going to be you, the other person, and then whatever the life crisis is. So it can be a good way instead of thinking it's me versus them. Don't settle for less uh, when the help you get doesn't make you feel validated or better. So sometimes we'll beat ourselves up thinking, oh, I'm just, I'm asking for too much or I'm, you know, I'm just being too needy or I'm being too clingy. That's a big one that I hear. It's big, especially people get very insecure thinking that they're just too much. You are not too much. You're not asking for too much. There's just a lot of people out there who don't know how to give what you're asking for because they don't even know how to give it to themselves. So people can only give as much as they know how to um, give to themselves. So, you know, if someone only fills their own pot like 50% of the way, they're never, like, maybe at first they'll fill yours 100% of the way, especially if they're codependent, 
But with time, they won't be able to keep that up because they only know how to fill their own 50%. So um, just kind of keep that in mind. No, it's not a you thing. It's a them thing. And that, I, that sounds so cheesy and I never like saying it and because it doesn't really feel legit, you know, especially for if you're that kind of person like me who's just very much a seeker of, well, what was my part? How, how could I have made it better? You know, there sometimes there just has to be that acceptance that you, you know, you're you're not fully responsible for these things, and you deserve to feel validated and to feel better. Learn to be okay with saying no by practicing. Understand you will not be good at it at first. Be okay with hearing no as well. Yeah. So if you uh, get to a place, this is really really useful for anxiety. So if your anxiety is something that spikes up a lot and you feel like you need to take a lot of time away from people, um, being able to say no to people, like when, like about little things, uh, that perhaps like you just, this is where you got to really read your gut a little bit. you you say like you got something really fun you wanted to work on like a project and then someone hits you up and then they're like, I really, really want to do this thing with you. You know, that you're going to have that little gut feeling that's like, well, do I do the thing for me or do I do the thing for them? And it might not feel super obvious, like it's really, really hard at first to read what the correct answer is. And for me, what I used to do is I always just picked the thing that the other person wanted to do to make the other person happy, very self, or very serving to other people all the time, not very self-serving. And I would do it constantly until I was burned out. And then I never had any time for the things I wanted to do. It took me like years to, to kind of start learning how to say no. And the best place to start when you're practicing saying no is say it about little stuff that doesn't really matter. Like in terms of like someone asking you something with like it's an acquaintance or something or someone you don't know really well as a friend. Start with there because that's a safe place to kind of say to test out how to say no in polite ways. So you don't have to straight up say no. You could say um, something like I, uh, I'm not available right now or I'm not available at that time or I, I, that's not going to work for me. The, you can look up all these like cool scripts for like uh, alternative ways so you don't have to just be like no you know and just send them like a big fat no <laughs> I mean when you're learning early on like that's basically like a rigid boundary right you're just being like no but if you're if you're learning how to be how to do, say no with grace I think Terry Cole's got some videos on how to do that that are really really useful um but the good thing also is that the cool thing is that once you learn how to start cutting back and saying no to other people you actually won't mind when people say no to you. So you might notice like if you're always saying yes to people and then they um, they say no to you, you're gonna be 10 times more butthurt and you won't actually accept it because you're holding standards for yourself that say, that dictate that you would say yes for everyone so therefore everyone needs to say yes to you. It's a form of projection I think where um, you know we it's that whole I want people to treat me or I treat others how I how I want to be treated thing and sometimes how we how we want to treat others and how we treat ourselves isn't healthy so we need to fix that first and then then the way we treat others and it'll come across a lot better and more compassionate. So yeah so understand that when you're going through the process early of saying no um, that it's also going to be hard to hear no, but it's going to get easier because it's a give and take and you're, you're, you're learning how to balance stuff out. You're learning the new equilibrium. So the next one is allow yourself to feel. This is number six. Allow yourself to feel is something I'm still learning how to do. It's funny because I'm a very empathetic, empathic, sensitive, whatever person, which means my CBT therapist first said this. I was like, dude, I know how to feel. I feel all the time. I can't stop feeling. I can't, I don't know how to control how to not feel like I know like when I'm feeling sad or angry or like nostalgic or like I, I, I feel these things deeply so I thought like I knew how to allow myself to feel but that wasn't really the case what it was was that it allowing yourself to feel what it really is what like I think the way it should really be worded is learning how to tell yourself it's okay when like when you feel these things like it's almost like the art of giving yourself the freedom to let an emotion come out uh even if you feel it's not good like <laughs> the thing i learned was like 
I always let happy, anything happy or good related, all those emotions could come out. And the bad ones would come out too, but they would come out against my will at a time in which I didn't want them to. So like I would get like these bouts of anger or I get these bouts of sadness or just cry uncontrollably. And, and it would just come out in large amounts. And so because it was coming out in ways that I didn't feel I was really controlling, then that means what was happening was I was controlling it. I was controlling it when it, when it, I should have been doing it earlier. So it's coming out at inconvenient times. So I should have been allowing myself to feel earlier so I could do it when it was necessary. A good example of this is that always made me feel a lot better was like, especially with the, the crying thing, was I think I read the scientific thing that said, if you feel the urge to cry, you technically only need to let yourself do it for like 60 seconds. And then anything after that is pretty much you just kind of working yourself up and like, like continuing to want to cry basically um but if you just need to get the urge out like the feeling out you really only need 60 seconds so if, so say like you feel this big urge to cry right and you feel bad about it you're like i don't want to cry right now i don't want to i'm gonna I, i'm gonna feel shameful i'm gonna feel bad i don't want to cry i gotta hold it in set a timer in your phone for 60 seconds and then let yourself cry for just the 60 seconds tell yourself like okay i'll do it but just 60 seconds and then see if you feel better like, so then that way it's like a middle ground. Like, you're getting to do the cry that your body wants you to do, but but it's um, maybe not that huge one that you're afraid of, which is like, I'm going to cry for three hours if I start now. Like, it's going to ruin my whole day. So see what I mean? Because usually once you give yourself the 60 second mark, you probably notice like, okay, um, if I decide I want to stop now, I can stop. And I, I still gave my body what it needed. Uh, don't shut out triggers, funnel them the best you can with mindfulness and use techniques uh, you adopt to give yourself safe exposure therapy. I think it's called seeking safety actually, but yeah, safe exposure therapy is really good. Uh, do this in a structured environment or with a safe person. So um, Pete Walker's book definitely goes over some ways to do this a little bit, um, but I would probably recommend seeking out like a professional to really help you with it or some really good friends and then go on some fun like pretty safe trips doing some fun naturey things to practice it. Say like you're afraid of sleeping in your bedroom in the complete dark. Technically it's not really bad for your life if you wanted to keep a nightlight on forever you probably could but say like you feel this is a hump you need to get over. This is a personal crutch of yours and you need to be able to sleep fully in the dark. You can ask a friend or someone to maybe be there with you while you're going through it. And unfortunately, you're not really supposed to use things like, I think from what I read, you're not supposed to use like breathing techniques and all that mindfulness stuff. You're supposed to just let yourself feel the fear because then we understand that fear is just an emotion and it passes like everything else. The biggest problem with CPTSD and anxiety is that we fear the fear more so than anything, which makes it last longer. And because we're trying to run from it, we're not letting ourselves really feel it. Um, another good example of this is say like you have a somatic body pain symptom, something going on in your body. Um, you get a sudden pain somewhere and you, you know you get this and you, it's, and you got it checked and it was nothing before. So you're worried again that it's just you being, you know, causing yourself pain, right? So what I like to do is I go into a meditative state. I like to lay down in my bed and then I focus on the area that's painful. I actually did this to fix my IBS. And... Um, so you focus on the area that's giving you the pain, right? So you're laying there meditating. And what I like to say in my head is, I feel you. I, and then I, and then I list what I'm feeling. So I'll be like, there is a pain in my, uh, you know, like lower chest area on the right side. I feel it's right here. And I'll just literally like pretend like my brain is like, like a little, like there's a little dot and it's going down to the area and I'm honing in on it. So I hyper focus on the area. And then what I tell myself is I just say, I feel you. I feel that this hurts. This is this is pain. I feel that there is pain in this area. So you're validating it. And then what I notice is that typically it goes away. Um, if it doesn't go away after that, then you also give yourself the understanding that you have your phone with you and you say, okay, I have my phone with me. If we need to go to the hospital, if we need to go to urgent care, we can do that. And then see if the pain goes away then too. Cause this is usually anxiety related and telling your body that you feel it and you acknowledge that it's there um, is better because when we try to ignore it or we say like, okay, the pain will pass, like it's just, you know, I'm sure it's all in my head, I'm sure it's all in my head, you're not validating it. 
So what happens is it stays and it gets bigger and louder and it'll keep screaming at you and it'll just, and it, what it wants you to say is, I feel you, you know, it says I'm here. I, I, I acknowledge that, that this is hurting. And it's just our body's way of being like a little kid sometimes, I think. It's just like, hey, ouchies, and then you gotta be like, hi, like a parent, and be real nice and be like, I feel you, and then it'll stop doing that. Next is do not live solely in safe spaces or expect that everyone should know your triggers as it's too personal for everyone to know. Um, this falls into, under that victimizing complex mindset that people really, um, I think, need to focus on. And what I mean is like, okay, you can start off in a safe space if you'd like, create your own safe space um, for yourself, or m maybe like I said, like the Zen Den is great. We, the Zen Den for us is our safe space, but the rest of the house is like free game, you know, in terms of like life is going to happen, you know? And, um, but we don't want to limit ourselves to living in safe spaces. Um, safe spaces are like the, they're like the zone we come back to when life is scary, but we still have to go out into life. And we just know that the safe space is here for us to kind of come back. It's like home base, basically. You could technically make your whole house your home base if you wanted for a safe space. It's totally fine. But you can't, like, live your life being like, well, my work needs to be a safe space, too. And my, you know, my whatever, like, you can't. It's just have a designated zone for it. And remember that not everyone's going to know your triggers um, because that's your responsibility to tell them what they are and they're going to be very specific to you and your personal stuff. There's too many things out there in the world that trigger people that we can list them off and therefore make them safe for everyone. Um, there's, there's just too, too many things. Next one is understand feelings and logic don't always line up. Make decisions based off of what you want and not just what you feel because you are you formulate your reality based off the things you want and you are not a culmination of just how you feel. So this is a really good one um, when you're doing things like getting into um, things that are highly irrational and emotional like relationships. So you might feel an urge to do something and definitely listen to the feeling because the feeling is trying to tell you something about your subconscious self. Usually it's going to tell yourself about your attachment styles or it's going to tell you something about um, your fears or something related to vulnerability or intimacy from your childhood. So definitely like listen to it but understand that just because you feel that urge doesn't mean that should be what you should do. So like a good example this might be like so say like you know you have an like an anxious say like you're very anxious in dating and you know that you feel like you say like you have abandonment issues stemming from cptsd so you know that you are very clingy to a partner this doesn't mean we excuse the behavior and say well i'm just really clingy to my partner therefore they need to message me four times a day and um, i'm not going to be happy unless i'm seeing them 24 7. that's not going to work instead that's what you feel right so you feel like you need that constant validation that constant support that constant like they're constantly there all the time but maybe deep down you know what you want like before say like before you met this person and you became irrational you know what you want is to have a healthy well-paced relationship that moves naturally and organically and is slow and things unfold with time and with understanding and through um like uh, lots of reflection and, and um, it, you know you take the time to really uh, sort through things right so that's what you want so you write down the things that you want first when you're rational at a time in which you feel peaceful and you you know like say like you're this is like between dating so you're not really dating anyone you're you're single you kind of worked on your self-care so you're at a good place so you're this is that part where you would write it down when you're at that place where you you kind of can sort out what you want then you can refer back to that when you start feeling these things that are going to hit you in a wave and are going to start dictating what you do. They're going to be like, oh, you need to, you need to, because they're going to do that. Your voice in your head is going to tell you, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to um, go, 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 go. And, and it's going to really push you. It's going to push you in an anxious, anxious direction because it's going to want to relieve that anxiety. And understand that the best ways to really relieve anxiety cannot be short-term methods. So people typically, when they get extreme anxiety that flares up, they will try to take the quick route. 
So they will do whatever they need to snuff out the anxiety as it's happening. So they'll do, they act on how they feel, right? Um, but in the long run, in order to really help with that emotional regulation and the anxiety, the better option instead is to implement some of those healthier coping techniques or mechanisms that we talked about earlier. And then that way you're ready for when you, um, so you can still stay on the path of what you want as opposed to what you feel. Think of it like not enabling yourself, right? You want to support yourself. So that means you might have to do some things you don't particularly like, but you know are good for you because it's what you want and you wrote them down before you became irrational. So yeah, so always try to strive for that path that is something you know that you want, um, if, even if your feelings contradict that, because they will. Feelings also will pass, so when they pass, all you're going to be left with is what you is if you got what you wanted or not. So that's why it's very important as well to stick with that. Next thing is journal uh, if what you feel and what you want isn't lining up or causing you anxiety. This can really help you figure out why they're not lining up, so I highly recommend it. Another one is uh, remember feelings are typically primal and mindfulness and self-awareness is what sets us apart from the animals. Um, so yeah, are going to be the most base form thing. They're very, responding to them is like just responding to things on autopilot. They're just going to be very instinctual. So that's why we want to implement that mindfulness and self-awareness to ask ourselves, why are we feeling this way? Why are we wanting these things? Um, and that can really help. And it, it's an active effort that you have to do, but it does become a little bit more natural the more you do it. Lastly, uh, use music or movies to help facilitate this. So um, say like you feel like you need to cry. You want to allow yourself to feel right and you feel like you need to cry and you have a really, really hard time allowing yourself to cry. Put on a movie that you know will make you cry or you suspect will make you cry and then use that to help facilitate the emotion to, because you're kind of, what you're doing is you're allowing your mind to focus on something else so you can um, not be so directly sitting there going, why aren't you crying? Or like, I really want to cry or la la la, you know, you want to, it can kind of open that doorway to help you sort of disassociate in a healthy way so you can detach, like, well, I guess it'd be more like you're detaching, right? So you're detaching far enough away so you can allow yourself to feel. Just be careful with that one too, because music, especially if you're, uh, say like you want to cry, um, you, you can also use music to help boost your mood, especially if, say, like, you know you've been in a sad state for too long, um, and you want, instead of you feel sad, right, but you want to start feeling happier, make yourself, like, a happy playlist, too. That's a really good one I like to do, is, like, um, I think I read this works really well with people, especially with PTSD. Make yourself a happy, happiness playlist that, you know, every time you hear these songs, like, when you are in a better place and you know that you bebopped these songs, your brain will go down those same neural pathways. And when you hear these songs again, even if you're sad, I've had this happen, I'll be like crying or whatever. And then I'll hear a happy song come on because like say like I have a playlist that's all shuffled and I'll just start bebopping and I'll be like, I was just sad like two seconds ago. <laughs> and, it, and it's just because, you know, your, your, your brain has those, yeah, you can, you can shift your, your neural pathways, like your your train, you can shift your train if you want to. So just kind of figure out what you want. Do you want to be sad right now? Do you want to be happy? I mean, make sure you let yourself feel it. But if you're wanting to move towards a path of like, okay, I've been sulking a little too long, it's a good idea to maybe make those little happiness playlists for yourself.